It's Oliver Santo Domingo alongside Gate Parfan and Ella Coronel and we will be sharing with you how different nutrients such as oxygen, carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur flow through the ecosystem. The cycle or pathway by which a chemical substance moves from an abiotic to biotic and back to the abiotic compartment of the earth is called as the biogeochemical cycles. The biogeochemical cycle is formed by the terms bio which means living, geo for rocks and soil, and chemical for the processes that are involved. There are two basic types of biogeochemical cycles, the gaseous and the sedimentary. This classification is based on the primary source of the nutrient input in the ecosystem. Inputs of nutrients to the ecosystem depends on whether the biogeochemical cycle is gaseous or sedimentary. Availability of essential nutrients in terrestrial ecosystems depend heavily on the nature of the soil. Supplementing the nutrients in the soil are the nutrients carried by rain, snow, air currents, and animals. Nutrient levels within an ecosystem can decline as a result of nutrient export or outputs. Outputs occur in a variety of ways depending on the specific biogeochemical cycle. Outputs are also transported in a variety of means, such as in the form of organic matter carried by a surface flow of water in streams and rivers, the leaching of dissolved nutrients from soils into surface water and groundwater, the harvesting of biomass in forestry and agriculture, which represents a permanent withdrawal from the ecosystem, and finally, through fire too, which is a major source of nutrient export in some terrestrial ecosystems. Carbon is found in all macromolecules and is a key component of fossil fuels. Carbon, as the foundation of life on Earth, is a component in every living thing. It makes all life possible and is a key ingredient in food that sustains us all. It is required to form complex molecules such as proteins and DNA. Carbon dioxide, a kind of gas from carbon, helps regulate the climate. Biological activities causes carbon to be constantly converted among different forms and locations. Thus, these movements of carbon are what we refer to as the carbon cycle. Carbon cycle is nature's way of reducing carbon atoms which travels in the atmosphere into organisms on Earth and then back into the atmosphere. Carbon cycles between the ocean, biosphere, and the atmosphere. This continual cycle regulates the amount of carbon on Earth. Nitrogen is needed in our DNA, RNA, and proteins, and is critical to human agriculture. Plants and animals need nitrogen to make proteins. Proteins are the building blocks of cells and are essential for cell production. Nitrogen cycle is characterized by the fixation of atmospheric nitrogen by mutualistic nitrogen-fixing bacteria associated with the roots of many plants, largely legumes, and cyanobacteria. Other processes in the nitrogen cycle include nitrification, or the bacterial oxidation of ammonia to nitrate and nitrates, the nitrification, or the reduction of nitrates to gaseous nitrogen. Lastly, ammonification, or the breakdown of amino acids by the composer organisms to produce ammonia. The global sulfur cycle is poorly understood. The gaseous phase of the sulfur cycle permits circulation on a global scale. The atmosphere contains not only sulfur dioxide and hydrogen sulfide, but also sulfate particles. The sulfate particles become part of dry deposition called as trifle, whereas the gaseous forms combine with moisture and are transported in precipitation or wet form. The oceans are a large source of aerosols that contain sulfate. However, most are redeposited in the oceans as precipitation and dry fall. Dimethyl sulfide is the major gas emitted from the oceans that is generated by biological processes. Various biological sources of sulfur emissions from terrestrial ecosystems exist, but collectively they cause only a minor flux in the atmosphere. Emissions from plants are poorly understood, but forest fires emit on the order of 3 times 10 raised to 12 grams of sulfur annually. It is almost impossible to estimate the biological turnover of sulfur dioxide because of the complicated cycling within the biosphere. 
Volcanic activity also contributes to the global biogeochemical cycle of sulfur. Major events such as the eruption of Mount Pinatubo released on the order of 5 times 10 raised to 12 to 10 times 10 raised to 12 grams of sulfur. Human activity plays a dominant role in the biogeochemical cycle of sulfur. Thus, to complete the picture of the global sulfur cycle, we must include the inputs resulting from industrial activity. Phosphorus occurs in only minute amounts in the atmosphere. Because phosphorus lost from the ecosystem in this way is not retained via the biogeochemical cycle, phosphorus is in short supply under undisturbed natural conditions. The main reservoirs of phosphorus are rock and natural phosphate deposits. Phosphorus is released from these rocks and minerals by weathering, leaching, erosion, and mining for use as agricultural fertilizers. In marine and freshwater ecosystems, the phosphorus cycle moves through three states, the particulate organic phosphorus, the dissolved organic phosphates, and the inorganic phosphates. Organic phosphates are taken up quickly by all forms of phytoplankton. The remaining phosphorus in aquatic ecosystem exists in organic compounds that may be used by bacteria. In the process of ocean upwelling, the movement of deep waters to the surface brings some phosphates from the dark depths to shallow waters. These phosphates are taken up by phytoplankton. Part of the phosphorus contained in the bodies of plants and animals sinks to the bottom and is deposited in the sediment. As a result, the surface waters may become depleted of phosphorus and the deep waters become saturated. Atmospheric oxygen is produced in the breakup of water vapor, where water molecules disassociate to produce hydrogen and oxygen. The hydrogen escapes into space, preventing it from recombining with oxygen. Another source of atmospheric oxygen is photosynthesis. Photosynthetic autotrophs, such as green plants, algae, and photosynthetic bacteria, produce oxygen as a byproduct. This oxygen is then consumed by both autotrophs and heterotrophs. In the early days of planet Earth, the amount of oxygen produced by photosynthetic microbes exceeded the amount taken up in respiration. This transformed the Earth's previously anoxic environment into an oxic one. All the reservoirs of oxygen, including water and carbon, are linked through photosynthesis. But because of how reactive oxygen is, its circulation throughout the ecosystem is incredibly complex. Oxygen combines with a wide range of chemicals in the Earth's crust and reacts spontaneously with organic compounds and reduced substances. In these states, oxygen is temporarily withdrawn from circulation. Aside from respiration, the oxygen produced from water vapor and photosynthesis is also used up in combustion, decomposition, corrosion, and rusting. Part of the atmospheric oxygen is also reduced to ozone through ultraviolet radiation. In the stratosphere, ozone shields the Earth from harmful ultraviolet rays. Closer to the ground, however, ozone has more harmful effects. It is a pollutant and can irritate eyes and respiratory systems, as well as injuring and killing plant life. In soil, nitrogen deposition initially acts as a fertilizer for plant life, which increases rates of net primary productivity. The problem begins when water and other important nutrients become more limiting relative to nitrogen. When this happens, the ecosystem approaches nitrogen saturation. As nitrogen supplies continue to increase in these ecosystems, a complex series of changes to soil and plant processes occur. These changes eventually lead to soil acidification and forest decline, which are extremely detrimental to plant and animal life in the area. All of this happens because of anthropogenic human activities such as fossil fuel combustion and unregulated, high-intensity agriculture. Although the biogeochemical cycles are present to cycle nutrients that are essential to life in ecosystems, human activities have made the outputs of these cycles toxic. It is incredibly alarming that humans have negatively affected even the most fundamental aspects of life here on Earth. It is clear that a change in human activities and malpractices will ultimately decide the fate of our planet.